Okay. Well, Google Plus is telling us that we are now broadcasting live, uh, and we know that a lot of people will continue to join us for the next few minutes here. But uh, for those of you who are Johnny on the spot, welcome to the CosmoQuest Science Hour uh, Hangout on Air. Quite a mouthful. Uh, I'm Matt Kaplan. You may have thought that I was Emily Lakdawalla because your screen is probably telling you I'm Emily Lakdawalla, but no, I am not Emily Lakdawalla. And um, anyone who knows what Emily looks like, that was, I'm sure, obvious within a moment or two. Uh, Emily, with Pamela Gay, the other regular host of this uh, Hangout, they are both at the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference, which is underway right now in Texas. They are just tweeting like mad. Their thumbs have to be worn out uh, because there is so much great science uh, being unveiled there. They're having a terrific time. And they say hello and love and kisses. And they asked me to uh, fill in for today. My name is Matt Kaplan. I believe I said that. I'm the, uh, I work for the Planetary Society. And uh, my title there is something like media producer. And uh, among other duties uh, that that includes is my hosting of our radio show called Planetary Radio, which you can check out on our website at planetary.org. It's a weekly half-hour show, and we talk to uh, some of the most interesting scientists, engineers, uh, creative folks, like the fellow who's down at the bottom of the screen there right now, Andre, uh, writers. Uh, science fiction and otherwise, and uh, we talk about uh, space exploration and development, which of course is what the Planetary Society is always about, is, uh, is also about. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, founded by Carl Sagan and a couple of other great guys, Lou Friedman and, um, oh my God, Bruce Murray, almost forgot, good Lord, uh, about 31, 32 years ago now. And uh, we are active in a number of different areas, mm -hmm. including political advocacy on behalf of uh, planetary and, and space exploration. We uh, have a light sail, our own solar sail project, which has currently got its thumb out waiting for a ride because uh, it's all set to go. We uh, are leaders in the uh, effort to identify and then maybe do something about near-Earth objects and a host of other things that you can check out at planetary.org. And this also connects us uh, to uh, the guest that we have here today, who uh, you see with his really jewel-like telescope behind him there, <laughs> the, the quest, Questar, quest, Questar, right? Not Questar, Questar. Yes. Questar. Um, and wasn't that the name of a uh, Gene Roddenberry character in a pilot? Thing? Questor, I believe. Questor, Questor I think case. you're right. Andre Bermanis is our, is our guest today, speaking to us from his home. Uh, Andre uh, is a consultant to the Planetary Society, but he is so many, many, many other things. He uh, may uh, have become known to many folks who might be watching this right now because of his work within the, uh, the Star Trek empire, not to be confused, confused with that other Star Wars <laughs> empire. Uh, but uh, he uh, is a longtime science consultant on uh, Star Trek Next Generation for the Star Trek uh, film series and uh, that is the feature film series, uh, but uh, went on to become a writer and a producer uh, for Star Trek, specifically Enterprise, right? That's right. And um, uh, uh, which uh, was just the beginning of his work uh, as a producer writer in television. Uh, you can take a look at his credits. I'll show them to you right now, as a matter of fact, if I can get to the right page here and click screen share. There is uh, his brand new website, which is skybynightproductions.com. Skybynightproductions, all one word, of course, .com. And uh, it has all kinds of terrific information about uh, Andre, including a little synopses, a little sampling of some of the work that he's done, and a uh, very nice uh, bio, uh, which uh, I'm, uh, I use partly as the basis for this. Uh, and it will tell you that um, one of the shows that he went on to, and I'm going to get rid of that screenshot now, if I can get rid of it. Did I share it? I didn't actually share it. Did well, I? I think it came up. Let me t warn everybody, if it's not obvious, I'm new at this. <laughs> <laughs> and no there's, a, there's a lot to keep track of here. We're going to be taking your comments uh, okay. that you can type in in Google Plus uh, in a few minutes. And uh, that will be a special challenge for me to try to keep track of. I'm going to try once more here, though, to get us this. There is Andre's uh, website. And uh, Andre, if you catch me and screwing up like that, go ahead and shout out. Okay. 
uh, try and leave out the expletives. Uh, there it is, skybynightproductions.com with a, a complete guide to uh, Mr. Bormanis. Uh, I was about to say that one of the mm -hmm. other uh, shows that he ended up working on, helping to create, uh, is, uh, I think, one of, one of two of the best, not quite full season science fiction series uh, in my experience. The first one being Firefly, which was followed three years later by Threshold. A terrific show with a fantastic cast and a great premise, which, um, you know, when the, the aliens, they couldn't get here, right? So they did the next best thing? Yeah, they basically sent an unmanned probe that uh, was designed to generate a signal that would start reprogramming the DNA of any human being who came in contact with the probe. So basically, they couldn't get here, but they could turn this world into a world populated by their own species, which was their long-range plan, and something that our, uh, our heroes find out about and, of course, intend to stop. So, and like you said, we, we, we had a terrific cast uh, led by Carla Kajina, um, uh, who was wonderful. Peter Dinklage was part of the cast. Brent Spiner, of course, who everybody knows from Star Trek. And, um, you know, it was um, a wonderful experience. Bragi Schutt uh, created the show along with uh, David Goyer, who has gone on to do uh, some of the Batman movies and is a terrific mm -hmm. director and directed our pilot. And, of course, Brand Brand uh, Brandon Braga, who I worked with on Star Trek for many years. So we had a great writing uh, staff, a great cast, and uh, it was a wonderful show. And unfortunately, there were two other uh, alien-themed, <laughs> invasion-themed shows on the networks that year. Uh, we were on CBS. There was a show on ABC uh, called Invasion, and then a show on NBC called Surface. So uh, it was kind of hard to, uh, to kind of... Um, focus in on just one for people who are interested in that kind of uh, that kind of storytelling and I think that for that among other things uh, you know worked against us to a degree and unfortunately we only got to do uh, 13 episodes but it was uh, a terrific experience and one I'm very glad that I had damn shame and and yeah. I think as quirky and wonderful both you know in the cast and in the writing as was Firefly yeah uh, which, and one uh, small one small addition the uh, guest star for the episode that I wrote, uh, the main guest star, was uh, Viola Davis, who was just nominated for an Academy Award for the help. I'll be darned. Uh, I got to work with Viola, which was great. She was wonderful and lovely and did a terrific job. So um, if nothing else, you should <laughs> check out the episode with Viola Davis. All right. Uh, you should also, although it's going to be more difficult to do than it used to be, <laughs> this is one of Andre's books. Uh, this is the one that I bought when it was out new, Science Logs. And it's, um, it's really the science of Star Trek, except, as I told you at the time, Andre, I think it's better uh, oh, than, that, than that other book. Um, <laughs> I was happy to learn when I looked it up last night on Amazon that this is now worth $22. <laughs> I'm, I'm so. impressed. I've got a few <laughs> copies, so I, I know what to do if I need to raise a little emergency. <laughs> Yeah, keep those. Hard to believe. I wrote that 15 years ago. It is hard to believe. Published in 1998, so um, that's 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 kind of shocking to me to think about how long ago that actually was. Well, it's chock full of uh, Star Trek science and uh, relating it to the uh, the current world. And a cool little uh, device that it uses is that at the beginning of each chapter, there is an entry from the science log. Uh, which uh, I think was a, a nice touch. Thanks. Anyway, fun stuff to do. Uh, and uh, I, I'll just mention in passing, boy, long introduction, because there's so much to say about you. He is yeah. also, he's taught in uh, a number of uh, colleges and universities. He is an astronomer. He is a uh, pianist, classically trained pianist. And I didn't know this until I looked at the bio. You wrote the uh, planetarium show, Centered mm -hmm. in the Universe, which uh, was the first one, it was the, the premier program after the Griffith Observatory opened after being remodeled over the course of several yeah, years. Yes, um, Ed Krupp asked me to come in and help them write the narration. So along with Ed Krupp and Don Davis, the artist who created the extraordinary il illustrations that are used throughout the show, uh, we put together this, uh, this program called Centered in the Universe, and that was uh, what we... Uh, used at the um, grand reopening of Griffith Observatory, which underwent this extraordinary major renovation. It was four to five years in the making. They literally lifted the building off of its foundation 
to carve out new space underneath so that the the existing structure in the exterior of the building, which is you know quite historic and a Los Angeles landmark, uh, was basically untouched. All of the renovation happened essentially below ground, but the planetarium was completely renovated and um, uh, refitted with more comfortable seats and a state-of-the-art uh, Zeiss digital planetarium projector and laser projectors, and it's it's really it's really something quite special. And uh, I've always wanted to write a planetarium show. And was just thrilled when Ed invited me to uh, to uh, to help them do the, the the one that would reopen Griffith. And it is for those of you who have not been to LA or maybe have missed the observatory, don't miss it next time you're in town. It really is a must see in our town. It's been one of my favorite spots in the city uh, for as long as I can remember, and I've lived here my whole life. Yeah, it's a terrific uh, place. Well, we're seeing. Mm -hmm. uh, one more uh, Andre Bermanis uh, tidbit. Uh, which is that when you were serving as the science consultant to uh, Star Trek, you introduced astronomy to a number of the Star Trek cast members. And I happen to know that Bob Picardo, uh, a mutual friend and a supporter of the Planetary Society, member of our advisory board, I believe, uh, yeah. uh, gives you full credit for that. <laughs> full, credit, full credit or full blame, I'm not sure which. <laughs> Hi. You still there? I think I lost you, Andre. Yep. Uh, there you are. You're back. Picture oh. froze for a moment. Oh, okay. Um, I invited him and some other cast members to participate in a fundraiser for the Planetary Society. This was, again, 10, 12 years ago now. Uh, we did some uh, readings from the works of Ray Bradbury at the Pasadena Playhouse. And uh, we had several Star Trek actors involved. Bob was one of them. Nichelle Nichols, who played Lieutenant Uhura, of course, in the original series. Tim Russ, who was Tuvok on Voyager, uh, Charlton Heston, who uh, has never had anything to do with Star Trek, but obviously <laughs> everybody would recognize his name, uh, did a reading. So it was a terrific evening, and it was also, again, an opportunity for me to uh, achieve another lifelong dream and work in a small way with uh, one of my uh, heroes uh, growing up, an icon of science fiction, Ray Bradbury. So I got to sit down with Ray and Bruce Murray and Lou Friedman and kind of figure out... Uh, what kind of a program to put together, how we would frame it, uh, you know, get some actors involved and so forth. And Bob had a great time, and he's, you know, he's a very bright guy, very interested in the sciences. Uh, I just saw Bob Sunday night. Um, he is going to be speaking at SETICON 2 up in uh, San Francisco in the Bay Area uh, this June. I'm going to be there as well, and um, Bob will be there, possibly some other actors from Star Trek. So, yeah, he's, uh, he's really... Um, really embraced the Planetary Society and has been a great asset to us uh, as, a, as a fundraiser and uh, spokesman and ombudsman and, um, you know, something that uh, he actually takes a great deal of joy in. My boss, Bill Nye, yes. the CEO of the Planetary Society, yeah. we call him Bill Nye the Planetary Guy now, mm -hmm. he will also be speaking at SETICON too. That's right. Yeah. I, I hope I'll be up there again to, uh, to cover it for Planetary Radio. Right. I was, had a great time last time. Yeah. Uh, I want to just mention to anybody who may have joined us since we first started, this is the CosmoQuest Science Hour Hangout on Air. I am not Emily Lakdawalla after botched uh, plastic surgery, which is a joke I stole from <laughs> Andre. Uh, I, I, Emily and Pamela Gay are at the LPSC, uh, which is the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference this week. So I'm filling in for them, Matt Kaplan from the Planetary Society, with my guest, Andre Bermanis, writer, producer, uh, astronomer. I keep wanting to say astronaut. You wish. <laughs> Wouldn't that uh, be nice? Um, let's, let's go on to, uh, oh, and I should remind you, Emily has put in here that I should remind you, to, if you're watching us on Google+, Plus, please plus one us right now so that we know that you're out there. Uh, that's uh, the best way for us to, uh, to know that we've got an audience out there. We know the word is out and saw a few indications that people are out there. Do keep in mind that we'll be taking your comments and questions a little bit later if I can keep my eye on the little comment window here. After you know, one man banned it here, so we'll see how it goes. Andre, I, I had advertised with Emily's help, that we would be talking about a, really a pretty common theme, and that is the role of science fiction and what we find in science in the real world. And maybe we'll limit it a little bit more, narrow it down to science fiction as it has uh, uh, appeared in television and the movies, uh, which is certainly you know, your areas of expertise. And I wonder, you know, you and I were talking earlier today about this book, Abundance.
yes. by uh, Peter Diamandis mm -hmm. and uh, Stephen Kotler, which uh, really, I'm only actually through one chapter of it so far, but the uh -huh. book is about a bright future for humanity, not mm -hmm. without bumps along the way, but a future with a tremendous amount of promise and a tremendous amount of goodwill and um, better lives for even people in the third world uh, through technology, which it struck me that that is perhaps not a theme of a lot of science fiction, but it was a theme that came up constantly in Star Trek. That's very true, and I think that's, that's one of the unique things about Star Trek. It was uh, um, ultimately a relentlessly positive view of the human future, and I think most science fiction Certainly in the movies uh, these days, and, and a lot of science fiction and literature, especially during the Cold War era, um, was really kind of dystopian. Um, they were, you know, a lot of the writers were interested in telling these cautionary tales about what might happen if we don't clean up our act. So they, they portrayed very dim futures. Um, uh, Fahrenheit 451, a great Bradbury novel, of course. Um, thought uh, independent thinking was something that was essentially outlawed and so of course they got to get rid of all the books so firemen were not uh, were not um, people who went around putting out fires they were the people who started fires to burn all the books in the world um, if you look at um, you know uh, films like alien and um, um, the day the earth stood still um, and uh, you know one of my favorites from the 50s all kind of stark warnings about the dangers uh, that are uh, awaiting us in the future in space here on the Earth. Star Trek, uh, you know, sort of tipped its hat toward the idea that, yeah, the 20th century, uh, not our best century in a lot of respects uh, in terms of a lot of war, uh, a great deal of poverty and unnecessary suffering. But the premise of the show was that, you know, in the future, things are going to be much better. And we're going to experience some bad times. We may even see, you know, a partial collapse of our technical civilization, wars. But in the end, we're going to come together. We're going to put aside our differences. We're going to recognize that we've been behaving badly and uh, <laughs> grow our technological adolescence, as Gene Roddenberry liked to put it, and work together to build uh, a future in which humanity explores the stars. And I think the appeal of that really can't be understated. It's clearly one of the one of the driving forces behind the success of Star Trek over all of these decades now is, is that essential optimism of the vision behind uh, that, that, uh, that series of TV shows and movies. I think that that was true also in uh, the series that you were most uh, closely affiliated with, Enterprise, yes. uh, uh, because there was this sense through much of the series, not all of it, because mm -hmm. they ran into some big challenges there too, right. that um, you know we were the new guys in town, yeah. in the galaxy, it was like, hey, we're from Earth! Uh -huh. <laughs> you know? uh, what, what's new around here? And right. sometimes got their, got their feelings and other things stepped on a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and when, when we did Enterprise, we wanted it to you know, essentially be a prequel to the Star Trek universe, the universe that we've all come to know and love and talk about the early days when it was a little more rough and tumble, when we were wet behind the ears, we didn't really know what we were doing out there, the Vulcans uh, didn't think we were ready to get out there to the, way that, to the extent that we wanted to. And so, yeah, we ran into problems, and, uh, but we had, a, we had a crew who I think more so than the other series uh, were more like uh, you and me, people... Mm -hmm. uh, People like us, imagine if you and me and some of our friends were given a starship to go off and explore the galaxy. We wouldn't be the cool and calm professionals of the Captain Kirk, Captain Picard, Captain Janeway, uh, Captain Sisko era. Uh, we would be like giddy teenagers and, uh, you know, <laughs> excited and scared and, uh, uh, you know, reluctant to step into the transporter even though we really want to see what's down on that planet. So that was kind of the tone of the show which was very different, and I think some people really liked that and some, you know, not so much. But, um, but I thought that that was, um, you know, that was a, a fun chapter in the history of the Star Trek universe, this notion that, you know, there was a beginning, that it wasn't easy, it was very exciting, we made a lot of mistakes, but then, of course, uh, we ultimately thrived and became, uh, you know, the... the the centerpiece of this vast federation of like-minded uh, uh, spacefaring species. Uh, 
to go back to the the earlier theme that we were talking about, these dystopian futures. Um, yeah. You know, I think of Blade Runner too. Yeah, sure. Uh, not the kind of place I'd want to live. Um, right. There seems to have been in the movies, at least, particularly in the most recent years, um, far more of these uh, very pessimistic visions than there have been of the of the positive ones that we see in in mm -hmm. Star Trek. And I don't know. Do you think that's just is that just human nature to? Uh, uh, and maybe the function of science fiction to you know give us these warnings about what might be if we're not careful. Well, sure. I remember you know Ray Bradbury used to say that uh, you know when he wrote his uh, stories about the far future, he said you know I'm not trying to predict the future. I'm trying to prevent it. <laughs> so <laughs> you know people have legitimate concerns about uh, about all the bad things that could happen uh, if we if we are careless in the way that we uh, develop and use certain kinds of technologies. Uh, if we don't learn to be more tolerant of other cultures, other people, other ideas, if we don't, uh, you know, if we don't address the real needs of uh, of people who uh, have not had the opportunities that you and I have had, and who have not had the opportunity to live long and prosper, so yeah, I mean, I think it's certainly it's legitimate. It's uh, you know, it's not. Uh, I enjoy a lot of the you know, Blade Runner is great movie. So is the Day the Earth Stood Still. So is Alien. Uh, looking forward to Prometheus, um, and, and yet you know it, it seems that it's almost it's almost a little too much on that side. And I think part of it is because you have an opportunity, a built-in opportunity for conflict. It's easy to find the conflict uh, when you have a totalitarian totalitarian government oppressing an individual, as in 1984, for example. Harder to find the conflict in a utopian society where everybody is happy and healthy and free of want, <laughs> so the dramatic possibilities a little more limited in those kinds of uh, stories, and you have to find clever ways of, of uh, bringing conflict into those kinds of settings. But, um, you know, I think that in Star Trek it was, uh, you know, it was a nice balance. Uh, there was always Jeopardy, but uh, the premise of the show was that Jeopardy wasn't about people on Earth trying to uh, harm each other or... Uh, you know, uh, take power to themselves at the expense of others. It was about all the stuff that was out there that people weren't quite as enlightened as we are. So I think that's again the fundamental difference with Star Trek, uh, as opposed to some of these uh, some of these other science fiction uh, stories and films that we were familiar with. I guess we should mention uh, uh, Deep Space Nine as being a slight. Uh, veering off course of that because it, it did seem like they wanted to present a somewhat darker vision of the future and even to the point where maybe the Federation wasn't quite as benevolent as it had been. Well, they been. did, yeah. They, they, had a, they, had more, they, they were interested in, in, in doing more political themes on that show and there was a conflict built into the um, two alien races who kind of figured prominently in the series, the Bajorans and the Cardassians and a uh, history of warfare and mistrust between them and uh, the Bajorans having, uh, having been nearly destroyed by the Cardassians. But then there was also a, a political intrigue in the backstory on Earth, uh, not so much in the Federation, but in this little shady group called Section 31, which was kind of their intelligence agency that didn't officially exist and did the unpleasant things that... Uh, no upstanding member of the Federation would condone, but things that they felt were necessary for the survival of the Federation. You know, that was a different tack, uh, not necessarily the direction I would have gone. There was a similar theme in um, the Star Trek VI film, The Undiscovered Country, where there was actually a kind of a conspiracy among some of the admiralty of the Federation to uh, essentially destroy the Klingon Empire and Captain Kirk himself was somewhat, not directly complicit, but sympathized with that uh, perspective. And as I understand it, uh, from Nicholas Myers, who um, um, co-wrote and directed that film, Roddenberry really disliked that. Really? He thought that that was totally the wrong approach, that that was not Star Trek. <coughs> Our characters would never behave that way. Hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, I think he probably had a point. But, you know, at that point, Gene was not directly involved in the, uh, you know, in the franchise or the movies. Uh, they wanted to, you know, explore some different areas, push back some boundaries. And, um, you know, I think overall it was a good film. But I, I, I also sort of, um, I have to say I kind of winced, uh, you know, for example, after the uh, uh, 
there was a dinner scene where the Klingons were invited over to dinner and uh, they beam off the ship and uh, and our, our crew, Kirk and Spock and Uhura and the, those guys were kind of like, ugh, thank God they're gone, oh that smell, ugh, you know. And you know, the, the cast at the time I think had problems with some aspects of the ship. It's like, you know, aren't we supposed to be beyond all of this stuff? Yeah, even if the Klingons you know, weren't weren't exactly uh, you know the most hygienic species we've ever encountered. We would never judge that. You know, yeah. that's not what we're about, and we would not conspire to do something as underhanded as you know premeditated murder in order to foment a war that you know in the hopes that the other side's going to lose. So yeah, I mean, it, uh, we we have certainly gone off in some different directions and taken some risks on Star Trek that. That, that probably are not in the spirit of the original. But on the other hand, after you've done, you know, 500 episodes of the various series and 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 movies, you know, you start to look in some unexpected places maybe for inspiration. I thought 6 was a well-directed film. It just, uh, a few elements that disturbed me. Yeah. Even some minor things like... Uh, running through the kitchen and looking for something in boiling <laughs> pots of water, which just didn't right, seem right. right. But it did have one great redeeming value, which is that uh, we got that wonderful uh, introduction to, uh, you know, you really can't appreciate Hamlet unless you read it in the original <laughs> Klingon. The original Klingon, yes. Right. <laughs> no, there was some great stuff in it. And, of course, in the end, everybody learned their lesson, and justice prevailed. So in that sense, it was very much, I think, in the spirit of Star Trek. Yeah. Um, we are, uh, for those of you who uh, may have joined us in the last few minutes or need a reminder, this is the CosmoQuest Science Hour coming to you uh, courtesy of CosmoQuest. Uh, Pamela Gay and Emily Lakdawalla, who are the usual alternating co-hosts, are at the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference this week. So I'm filling in for them. I'm Matt Kaplan of the Planetary Society, where I host our radio show, Planetary Radio. My host is Andre Barmanis. Uh, longtime science consultant to the uh, Star Trek franchise and a writer and producer for Star Trek and, and many, many other productions as well as many other uh, pretty cool things that he uh, does. Uh, I'm going to invite anybody who wants to now, please do send us your comments and don't forget to click the uh, plus one button. Please do plus one us so that we do have a record of you out there and uh, we look forward to getting your questions for uh, Andre about, and I know it's kind of come off as kind of a Star Trek um, hour so far, but, you know, what can I say? That's, uh, I kind of like Star Trek. Uh, <laughs> Me too. Um, but uh, we do invite you to uh, get your comments in now, and I'll try and keep an eye on the little comment window, which is open on my screen. But, Andre, let me shift gears a little bit and go to uh, talking about what science fiction has gotten right and what it's gotten wrong. I mean, really, those of us who maybe are the biggest fans of science fiction, we don't look to it to predict the future. But it is often looked at that way by, by us and others. Uh, what do you think? Is it, has it had a decent record or not so much? Well, it, it really depends on, on the writer and the, and, and the, the driving force behind that writer's vision. If you look at somebody like Robert A. Heinlein, he was somebody who was a trained engineer, uh, a very smart guy who was very interested in technology and the social impact of technology. And he... Um, he knew his stuff when it came to astronautics, when it came to weaponry, and, and his novels, uh, the ones that specifically dealt with space travel, flights to the moon, the planets, and so forth, he, he really made, made a point of trying to use the best science of the day in making the worlds that he was inventing feel as real as possible. Uh, and, and, you know, he, whether he predicted, uh, you know, when human beings would land on the moon or when we would colonize other planets or whether there was life on Mars or Venus. Well, you know, he was a creature of his time. And I don't think that anybody in, say, the 1940s, 1950s even, would have anticipated that before 1970, human beings would walk on the moon. Uh, that seemed like something that may happen at the end of the century. And most of the experts who discussed those things, like Werner von Braun, for example, if you'd asked him in the mid-1950s when a human being is going to travel to the moon, uh, he probably would have guessed toward the end of the 20th century and had a very different conception of how we might get there relative to the way that we actually did. But again, um, you know, people like Heinlein paid attention 
to the Werner von Brauns of the world when Arthur C. Clarke collaborated with Stanley Kubrick to do 2001 A Space Odyssey. They worked with any number of technical consultants to really try to make sure that their depiction of what space travel might be like in 2001 was as accurate as they could make it. Now, of course, we don't have anywhere near the kinds of technologies, space, space flight technologies anyway, that were depicted in that film, uh, which for me, of course, is too bad. Uh, certainly, we could have had a, a pretty substantial space station by 2001 and a moon base, although I don't think it would have been anywhere near as elaborate as what was portrayed in that movie. Uh, you know, even in 1968 when that film came out, I think a lot of people looked at that moon base and said, well, good luck building that in the next 30 years. <laughs> you know, it was just kind of crazy in some res respects. A nuclear-powered spaceship that could carry astronauts to Jupiter, that on the other hand was, was quite plausible. And, you know, the reason that we didn't do those things uh, has little, if anything, to do with science. It's obviously a question of priorities, political issues, and so forth. A lot harder to get into space than uh, people realized, a lot more expensive. And I don't fault science fiction writers for, you know, sort of uh, not recognizing um, those kinds of things. But I think what the value is, um, is it shows you what the possibilities are what kind of choices we'd need to make in order to actualize those possibilities or prevent them. And in that regard, I think that many writers, even Ray Bradbury, who claims that he doesn't, you know, he doesn't know how to drive a car, let alone how to, you know, build a rocket ship, and he was never terribly interested in, in getting into the details of, of how a nuclear-powered spacecraft might carry a crew of 12 to Mars. Uh, but he was interested in the social dimensions of those questions. And, and that's, what he was, that's what he was exploring in all of those works, the impact of television. Uh, I think he was quite prescient when you look at Fahrenheit 451 and uh, you have wall-to-wall -wall television and you think about the, the dominant role that television plays in our lives today. It's only a matter of time before the big screen is basically an entire wall and then an entire room. Uh, he talks about, uh, you know, iPod-type little ear radios uh, in Fahrenheit 451 and how that creates a kind of a, um, um, alienation among people, that we become a little bit more removed from, from sort of normal human interaction, a little more isolated in our own lives, mm. maybe a little more narcissistic, and he... I think rightly warned against the dangers of, of that, the impact that that could have on society. So I think that, you know, the writers who try to engage these questions about what are these technologies doing to us as people, where might they lead society in the future, what are the upsides, what are the downsides, I think that science fiction has done a very good job of raising those questions and showing us the various alternatives in, in very intelligent ways. So, you know, I don't know any science fiction writer, and I know a lot of them. I don't know any, anyone who's trying to be Nostradamus. Hmm. You know, it's not so much about prediction. It, it, it's about showing people what if we take this road as opposed to that road. What might happen. It goes back to your, your quote from Ray Bradbury. He's not trying to predict the future. He's trying to prevent it. He's trying to prevent it. Yes, exactly. So I think that that's really what, you know, what good science fiction ultimately does. You know, it looks at those kinds of questions and tries to, you know, sort of develop scenarios uh, that suggest what, what, what some of the consequences of, of going down those paths might be. I wonder uh, if, about recurring themes in science fiction, mm -hmm. some of which show up in the world. And... Uh, I was talking to somebody uh, not too long ago, and we were talking about uh, the the Matrix, that uh -huh. series of films. Right. Uh, and uh, this person drew a comparison to Metropolis, that great old Fritz mm -hmm. Lang film of humans being sort of absorbed in the machine, right. and it was a very classist uh, yeah. society. I'm not sure I exactly caught the link between the Matrix and that, right. but here certainly were two films. We'll talk about Metropolis that. Uh, painted, uh, definitely seemed to be warning us about where at that time the world seemed to be going. 
Sure. And, um, you know, I haven't seen Metropolis in a long time, but, you know, we do see these themes cropping up again and again. And, uh, you know, it, a lot of science fiction, I mean, one could argue, and, and many people do, that the first, uh, the first legitimate science fictional novel, science fiction novel, was Frankenstein, you know, by mm. Mary Shelley, Prometheus Unbound, is the subtitle. And that was very much a, you know, science fiction premise. What if you could essentially construct a man out of the parts of other men and bring him back to life? Uh, you know, a lot was happening in the 1800s with respect to uh, um, medicine, biology, anatomy, and physiology. We were beginning to understand uh, more and more about how the human body works. Uh, it was Alessandro Volta who showed that, you know, you could stimulate the nerves of, a, of even a dead frog and make its legs twitch. And um, these ideas were, were frightening and compelling. And uh, it was really... Uh, you know, it was really part of Mary Shelley's genius to recognize that whether or not you can actually bring, bring some dead being back into life, we are developing extraordinary new capabilities in medicine and biology that may have unintended consequences that, that, uh, that we will find uh, particularly difficult, if not threatening. And, and so, you know, if you, if you look at science fiction since uh, since uh, Shelley's sort of, um, you know, seminal novel, then I think you see that those are the kinds of questions that keep cropping up, whether it's in the area of space travel, uh, you know, exposing ourselves to the dangers of space, maybe bringing some of those dangers back here to the Earth, like the Andromeda strain, um, um, whether you talk about the collapse of civilizations, dystopian futures like 1984 and, and Blade Runner, or, or things that have more to do with uh, our own sense of, of uh, reality. What, what makes us human? What, what, what defines uh, you know, what we call real? Uh, that was certainly a big theme in a lot of Philip K. Dick's work. Um, the, the Matrix. Up on that, obviously. The red pill and the blue pill. Ultimately, you know, is reality just what, what we perceive with our senses? Uh, yeah, this table that my laptop computer is sitting on certainly seems solid. Fact is, it's mostly empty space. That is something that we learned about through science, and that's a pretty strange thing. You know, what else might we learn that would that would have that kind of a profound effect on our perception of of reality? So, you know, all of those themes. You know, um, you know, what it is that these discoveries and technologies do to us as human beings, as a society, whether it's in space, whether it's biology, whether it's creating replicants, you know, human beings who are purely synthetic and don't live as long as we do and don't necessarily have the same rights. Um, time and again, those, those uh, uh, stories always bring us back to these fundamental questions about, you know, who are we, what, is, what are we like as a society, uh, what is real, what is right, what is fair. And, uh, you know, because science is, uh, is uh, an endlessly uh, advancing process, I think science fiction as a literary form uh, will never exhaust uh, all of those possibilities. You know, uh, to bring it back to Star Trek, as we inevitably would, um, <laughs> there were wonderful explorations of what it means to be human throughout uh, the franchise. I think of, I mean, you know, from Spock yes. to Data mm -hmm. to Seven of Nine. Right. Uh, and um, uh, I think even, I mean, you had a Vulcan character in Enterprise who seemed to be uh, uh, torn between uh, her Vulcan heritage and uh, being surrounded by these humans all the time who were having undue influence on her. Yeah, Star Trek, uh, we always had a, a character who provided that outsider point of view. Um, and, and, you know, in, in primarily to be able to uh, kind of comment on uh, the human condition from a, a different perspective. And uh, I guess that's the kind of thing that uh, an alien might be able to get away with that a human couldn't. You know, I remember there was a line in the original series, I think from one of the early season one episodes, where there's a man who's been beamed aboard the ship. He sort of smuggled himself aboard. And he was in the middle of some kind of psychotic break. He was, you know, totally, totally crazy. And then we find out subsequently that he was a psychiatrist from this sort of um, 
um, psychiatric colony that, uh, you know, was sort of the repository of all of the sort of hard cases that mm -hmm. uh, even 23rd century medicine couldn't quite deal with. And when Spock sort of finds out about this, he's like, you know, he says to uh, McCoy, interesting, you, uh, you human beings celebrated uh, organized violence for centuries, and yet you condemn those who practice it privately. <laughs> now, you know, coming from somebody other than Spock, coming from a human character, that line would be a little hard to swallow. But coming from an outsider, wow, that's 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 uh, that's that's pretty much a uh, a stunning line that makes you think. Didn't Roddenberry say that he, you know, put this story in the future because he was wanted to talk about themes that he couldn't put in the present in a present day uh, story? Oh, absolutely. You know, he, in fact, he he already had a kind of a history of that when he was writing for shows like Have Gun, Will Travel or some of the other, you know, the TV westerns that he, uh, he wrote for when he was making his living as a freelance writer, he tried to work those themes into his stories and found very quickly that there was a limit to how much you know, the, the networks would let you get away with. Uh, and, of course, at the time, <coughs> it was only network TV. You know, there was a, maybe a little bit of original programming at some of the larger independent stations, but typically that was just like, you know, uh, morning kids shows or cooking shows or something. And so Roddenberry felt that, hey, you know, if I really want to do this, if I really want to talk about these issues of, you know, gender roles and gender equality and war and peace and um, and racism and, and all these other topics that were clearly, um, you know, uh, a source of much debate in the 1960s and, you know, caught up in the civil rights movement, the Vietnam War, and so forth. Um, he said, you know, I think i got to do science fiction. If I put these stories in the far future on a spaceship, you know, and have these alien beings with pointed ears and what have you, uh, it'll probably go past a lot of the network censors. They'll dismiss it because it's science fiction. And if they, and if they don't take it seriously, they're not as likely to kind of censor mm. me. Now, he did occasionally have some problems with the censors, as it turns out, but uh, you know, it was also just a, a much better way to sort of enhance the um, the sort of the craziness of of uh, some of the things that were going on in the world, uh, and saying, look, you know, how absurd is it to judge somebody by the color of their skin? How absurd is it to to assume that you know women can't do pretty much anything that, that a man can do just as well. Uh, you know, these are these are assumptions that, for whatever reason, have been around maybe for centuries, but we're becoming more enlightened in recognizing that these things are false. And uh, science fiction is a great way to show you the absurd extreme that brings you back to that sort of, wow, I really hadn't thought about it that way before kind of revelation. Let me remind everyone that you're watching the CosmoQuest Science Hour Hangout on Air. I'm Emily Lakdawalla, and if you'll buy <laughs> that, uh, uh, you're probably, I don't know, maybe you are a science fiction reader. But Emily and uh, Pamela Gay this week, your regular uh, host of the program, are at the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference in Texas, which they will no doubt be talking about over the next uh, week here in video, and they're tweeting like mad about it right now. I'm Matt Kaplan from the Planetary Society. My guest is Andre Bermanis. A science consultant to Star Trek and many other outlets, and a writer and producer of a number of uh, the most interesting uh, speculative fiction uh, programs that have been on recent television. Uh, I am, uh, as I said earlier, a one-man band here, and I am afraid that I'm probably getting the comment capability wrong somehow. So I apologize to those of you who may be trying to post your comments in Google+. We would welcome them if only they could reach us, but I'm excuse me, only seeing the three that, um, uh, that we've, uh, uh, Emily uh, put in one herself. So I do apologize for that, but uh, certainly hope that you're enjoying the conversation as much as I am. Andre, we have about 15 minutes left. I want to go through one other grand 
theme in science fiction, mm -hmm. and uh, that is, you know, the close encounter or the first encounter. And we don't really have anything in the real world yet to compare it to, although the SETI Institute and other agencies like the Planetary Society continue to work uh, toward that, uh, that first encounter mm -hmm. with uh, alien and hopefully intelligent life. Right. Um, what do you think of how science fiction has handled this? I guess, once again, it's a pretty wide spectrum. It is, and, and for the most part, uh, you know, science fiction has treated contact with alien life as a metaphor. When H.G. Wells wrote uh, uh, The War of the Worlds, uh, he very much had in mind uh, English colonialism mm. and uh, the fact that England, in developing its empire, um, was not necessarily kind to some of the natives uh, that they encountered and found them quite easy to subjugate because uh, they were uh, technologically inferior to the British troops. Um, Wells thought, you know, what if the shoe were on the other foot? What if we were the ones who uh, were invaded by people who were technologically superior? How, how would we feel about that? So again, it was a metaphor. And um, Ray Bradbury kind of turned that around in the Martian Chronicles. Human beings essentially invaded Earth and uh, that was kind of a metaphor for the uh, uh, American expansion into the West in the 1800s where uh, we weren't really particularly fair to the Native Americans who were living here for the most part perfectly content with the lives that they had. And so alien contact, I think, in science fiction, you know, it, is, it, it's, about, it's about how we encounter the other, how, how, the, how, the, uh, how meeting somebody who is so vastly different from <laughs> you, your life, your values, what you know and understand or think you know and understand, uh, reveals your own prejudices and limitations, your own fears and anxieties in many respects. So I think that, again, it's, it's mostly holding up a mirror to human beings in, in a way that uh, kind of puts us in a, in, a, in a very extreme predicament. And if you look at... Um, you know, films, again, throughout the 50s and 60s, there were many metaphors of, um, you know, Cold War themes being echoed in movies about human first contact with alien life. Um, certainly things like The Day the Earth Stood Till Still. It's a film called Angry Red Planet. <laughs> kind of obvious metaphor, I guess, for the communist Russia. To say nothing if Mars needs women. Yeah, well, exactly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, they're, they're again, they're, they're mirrors, they're, they're, um, they're not intended for the most part to be thoughtful um, meditations on what alien life might really be like. Now, some, some, sometimes, you know, some science fiction writers will go down those roads and try to imagine interesting, unique alien life forms that are intelligent and unexpected and you know, that can be very fun stuff. Now, uh, can I interrupt you? Bill and I, Bill Nye and I were talking earlier today about the Horta. In yes, the Horta. Star Trek. And, uh, you know, completely, uh, probably about as alien uh, an intelligent species as you could find, and yet one that still shared some of our values. Exactly. And, uh, and again, you know, a great, um, you know, a great story that was essentially about prejudice. We see this ugly thing, it's killed some people, we assume it must be hostile and, um, and uh, basically a brute, you know, not an intelligent being at all, but just a predator, you know, like a, like a shark or a, or, a, or, a, uh, you know, or a leopard in the jungle. But then we find out, of course, it's really just a mother protecting its young. We'd inadvertently been destroying its eggs. So, you know, that was another great Star Trek moment of question your assumptions. Don't, don't think you know everything that, uh, that uh, you know, you might believe to be true um, because that's what ultimately gets you into trouble. One other Star Trek episode that I, 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 you know, obviously talking about many of my favorites, but I think they're a lot of people's favorites. This was out of uh, Next Generation, and it was a fascinating one. Um, not perfect in what they attempted to do, mm -hmm. but an extremely noble attempt. And this was where uh, Captain Picard and an alien captain transported down to a planet and had to try and communicate with each other uh, to forge an alliance. 
And, uh, but the problem was that the alien species spoke only in metaphor. Do you yes. know the one I'm talking about? Oh, of course, yeah. It's called Darmok. Yes. Yeah, and Paul Winfield played, uh, played the alien captain. And I thought that that was a really clever... Um, a really clever way of looking at the problem of communicating with a truly alien intelligence. And that's, of course, one of the big questions in SETI. Uh, if we do get a signal, will we even be able to understand it? Will we be able to translate it? What does it mean to translate a signal? Uh, you know, we use binary code now in just about everything, or hexadecimal code. Why would, why would we assume that Aliens, even if they have technology very much like ours, would develop ways of coding signals that are in any way comparable to the way that we do it. You know, it's, it's an assumption. But, of course, that's all we can work with because we've never met an alien. We don't have experience with other alien species. We don't know what's common and what's uncommon. We don't know if we're the exception or the rule. If we're the rule... Great. And, you know, SETI is kind of premised on the idea that, at least to some extent, we're the rule. That is, we're not going to be able to communicate with some intelligent form of alien life that is so different from us that we don't even recognize it as life. But that's not what SETI is looking for. SETI is looking for civilizations that have evolved pretty much the way that we have and have moved through a stage where they have astronomy, mathematics, and physics and they've built devices, radio telescopes, transmitters, electronic devices that may have been implemented somewhat differently than what we've done, but are based on an understanding of the same basic principles of physics. And so if there are other species out there that have developed along the lines that we have, maybe there's some reason to believe that, they would, um, that we would be able to develop some kind of meaningful form of communication with them. Uh, if they are significantly different from we are, uh, there's probably little, if any, hope of learning how to communicate with those species. After all, we, we have good reason to believe that, uh, that dolphins and whales are intelligent species on this planet. Mm. Maybe not quite as intelligent as we are. They're certainly not tool users. That they don't need to be. They don't live in an environment where tools would be a particular advantage. Uh, but we've not yet learned how to communicate with them. Uh, if most of the intelligent life in the universe is like whales and dolphins, it'll be a very long time before we, we make any kind of contact uh, with those life forms. But we got to hope that, you know, there are some other people at least out there sufficiently like us that there is an opportunity to communicate, to receive a signal and, and, uh, and translate it and understand it. Uh, speaking of first contact, uh, aren't we getting close to, or maybe Zeph from Cochrane has already been born, I think. Um, how soon, <laughs> <laughs> terrible way to put it, Yes. where's my warp drive? Forget my jetpack. Where is my warp drive? <laughs> um, you know, that's the kind of thing that um, I could imagine that 10, 15, 20 years from now, if we, if we finally understand what dark energy is, maybe we'll realize, hey, wait a minute, this dark energy is something that we could harness. And maybe that will be step one on the road to something like warp drive. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it may be that it's just not going to happen for a thousand years, or maybe not at all. It's one of those things that is too far removed from anything that we've done so far to be able to make a legitimate project prediction about if and when it might happen. Now, you can talk about nuclear thermal propulsion. Now, we know how to do that. We built a few prototype engines back in the 60s. If we decided that we wanted to build a uh, nuclear thermal propulsion spacecraft that could take a human crew to Mars, if uh, you know, the government uh, decided that was you know, an important national goal and everybody agreed that you know, we're going to pump a few billion dollars a year into developing that technology, you know, we'd have it in 10 years. Um, that's something that we know how to do. Uh, warp drive is still uh, purely speculative, but there are some tantalizing hints that maybe, just maybe, oh, and here comes a cat. Hey, cat. It's, it's almost <laughs> dinner time. This is Suki. She, she, she knows that she Hi, Suki. Has dinner at about 5 o'clock. Um, that's a prediction I could have made, but didn't. She's going to come up on this, on this table at some point. 
and join in the interview because not only does she like to eat a lot, she likes to be the center of attention. Um, but yeah, you know, um, it's not impossible that we'll live to see warp drive. I think it's extremely unlikely. But the exciting thing about living in these times is that you never know when the next breakthrough is going to happen. Yeah. And, um, you know, and, and the other thing that's kind of exciting is, you know, we're learning more and more about how biology works at pretty fundamental levels and uh, how to extend human longevity. There is at least one person in the world who was documented to live over 120 years. This woman in France who died a few years ago, I believe she was 121. I had a piano teacher when I was growing up. She was 21 years old when uh, the Wright brothers flew at Kitty Hawk. She lived to see men walk on the moon. She lived to be 104. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, it's, it's reasonable uh, to think that in the next 10, 20, or 30 years, the human lifespan, the healthy human lifespan, will look more like 100, 110, or 120 years. And if you can live, you know, for another 50, 60, 70 years, Think of what kinds of medical breakthroughs might happen in the next few decades that could extend your life even farther. So that's, that's what gives me a little bit of hope that, you know, I might live long enough to see some of these extraordinary breakthroughs. Now, I, if I live to be as old as my grandfather, 93, and pretty much healthy all through, you know, uh, his life, I, I would feel blessed. And, I, you know, I have no expectation of living into the far future, but it's not impossible, and, uh, and that's part of what's exciting about being alive today. You and Kurt Ray Kurzweil, I should say, who uh, wants to preserve himself for that singularity that he exactly. sure is coming in a couple of decades. Uh, he's much more optimistic than me, I think, about that stuff, but, but I wouldn't call him wildly optimistic. I wouldn't say mm -hmm. that he's crazy. He's a very smart guy, and I think that you know, he's on the more optimistic end of the spectrum in terms of what really might happen in the next few decades, but it's certainly within the realm of possibility, more so than, say, warp drive or even your own personal jetpack. I mean, you could buy a jetpack. It's just not a very efficient way to travel, as it turns out, and somebody developing one that would, uh, that would allow you to do your daily commute um, and be as affordable and reliable as your automobile, yeah, that's probably not going to happen. <laughs> Sorry. Well, we're almost out of time. I, there is one other piece of technology that I want to ask you about, somewhat more yes. mundane. Uh, but I want to remind and, first of all, thank everybody for uh, joining us for this CosmoQuest Hangout on Air. Uh, it will return, this Science Hour 1 will return next week. I don't know if it'll be Pamela. I think it'll be Pamela hosting because Emily did last week. But we'll see. Pamela Gay, Emily Lakdwala, the alternating hosts of this. Uh, my guest today, Andre Bermanis. The other piece of technology, wait a minute, I can't remember what it is. Uh -oh. so I, I have to get out my pad to remind <laughs> me. There it is. There's my pad. Uh, Apple is Mike Okuda and Rick Sternbach some money. <laughs> I think you're right. Pad or perhaps tricorder. You yes. told me earlier today that you could tell us a fun story about the origin of the tricorder. Oh, yeah. You know, you mentioned Peter Diamandis' new book. I knew Peter a little bit back when we were both in Washington, D.C. That was abundance, by the way, we talked abundance, about Abundance, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, when uh, Gene was developing the original Star Trek, he had this idea that it's going to be about a, a crew of several hundred people on a starship, it's going to have a kind of a Navy-like, you know, command structure. And he knew, of course, well, we're going to do this ship. It's going to be like a battleship. It's going to have a bridge. What else does it need? Well, crew quarters. It's going to have a mess hall. It's got to have a sick bay. It's got to have, you know, these guys are going to be in danger probably on a weekly basis. You're going to have to have a doctor. You're going to have to have a sick bay. What would the sick bay of the future look like? And he thought about, you know, today you go to the hospital, you know, with some kind of an injury. They sew you up with a needle and thread. It's you barbaric. Know, they, put a, they put a glass tube under your tongue to take your temperature someplace else. Uh, <laughs> they do x-rays. They've got to develop the film. It takes forever, you know. So this is really primitive. And he said, you know, you look at the advancement of technology today, the role that computers are playing, we've got radar. He said, I can't imagine that these technologies are not going to be applied in the future to the field of medicine. You know, it only makes sense. We'll have some kind of a radar thing maybe that can scan your body and get all of your vital signs. Uh, we'll have, uh, you know, we'll have uh, new kinds of drugs, and you know, you want a hypodermic needle. I think that, you know, could be basically uh, adjusted to deliver different dosages of different kinds of drugs depending on the patient. 
you'll have a handheld scanning device, this medical tricorder that you could use out in the field because people get injured in the field, you know, all the time in the military context. We're going to need to have a field-ready version of that device and so on. So, you know, he put all of this stuff into the show, and of course, in the first few episodes, we see the sick bay and those great bio beds, you know, and the readouts of the, uh, you know, the vital functions and stuff. And a few weeks after the series aired, he started getting letters from General Electric and Siemens and all of these companies that made advanced medical technology saying, how did you know we were working on this? <laughs> and he said, well, I didn't, you know, I didn't, I just, I just thought, what would happen if we logically extended, you know, 10, 20, 30, 100 years into the future, the technological developments that are happening today in radar and computers and all of these things into the fields of medicine? Because, you know, you, you know that ultimately that's got to happen. And we know that in the future for this starship, medical technology is going to have to be much more efficient than it is today. Or we're going to lose, you know, half of our crew before, you know, first season is over. So again, just asked himself logical questions and came up with logical answers. And isn't Peter Diamandis funding a new X Prize to develop a tricorder? He is. He, he has developed a prize for the first group to develop a tricorder. I don't know what all of the uh, constraints are. You know, it's going to have to be, you know, something that can do certain rates of tests and do them quickly and efficiently and, and inexpensively. Uh, Peter, as you may or may not know, is, is an MD. He went to medical school. so. He, uh, I don't know if he ever practiced medicine uh, because he got very interested in aerospace, <coughs> space travel, and all these other things. But uh, yeah, he, you know, his first X Prize uh, was was a big part of the motivation for Bert Rutan and his group to create Spaceship One. And his new X Prize, I think, will hopefully have the same impact on uh, medical technology. And before too long, you'll go to your doctor and uh, he'll do an exam with a tricorder, which I think will be great. Andre, I've got uh, two and coming up on three minutes past the hour now. Um, <laughs> I, have, time too. I have never had less than a terrific time talking with you in oh, this hour here. has thank added so to much. that. Thank you. And uh, thank you all of you who've been watching. One last uh, appeal to please uh, plus one us if you're watching in Google+. Plus. And uh, do return to the CosmoQuest.org website if uh, that's where you're watching us, where there will be lots of other great things going on, including next week's uh, Science <laughs> Out in CosmoQuest. Probably not a kitty on the uh, table, but you never know. Uh, and uh, I'll just leave you with the other piece of Star Trek technology, mundane technology, that as a kid I wanted to know wasn't all around us, and all of a sudden it showed up. And those were those doors that <laughs> like that. Now they're in every supermarket. There so you go. see, science fiction does get it right. Uh, my guest has been Andre Bormanis, consultant to Star Trek and uh, consultant to the Planetary Society, a writer, producer, director. This is his book, still available, though uh, not cheaply <laughs> at the moment, from uh, Amazon and perhaps some other sources. Uh, and um, it has just been delightful talking to you, Andre. It's always a pleasure, Matt. Thank you so much. I'm Matt Kaplan of the Planetary Society, and I hope you'll check out Planetary Radio. It's on about 150 radio stations and Sirius XM satellite radio on Sunday evening, 6.30 Pacific time. And uh, probably the easiest place to find it, though, is planetary.org or in the iTunes store, Planetary Radio. Uh, one of many things done by my employer, the Planetary Society, headed by my, uh, my boss, uh, Bill Nye, the science and planetary guy. Thank you again for joining us for this uh, CosmoQuest uh, Science Hour, and um, live long and prosper. You too. Right. <laughs>